Good evening. We're so thankful to be able to come together this evening and worship because that's what this is. It is a worship service. And the men who will stand before you are here to preach. But we want you to know first and foremost, what we do here is for the glory of God. We're thankful that you took the time to come out and to worship the true and living God and to fellowship with each other. We're not going to stay on the porch. We need to get on into the house so that these men will have plenty of opportunity to proclaim God's word. But first, I need to say something. If you are here for any other reason but to worship the Lord, you just might be in the wrong place. <laughs> worship is to the true and living God. Amen. And we hold him in awe and reverence for who he is and what he has done. Amen. Amen. Scripture reading will be found in Isaiah chapter 53. We will read verses 1 through 6 and then 10a. Then we will switch over to the New Testament, Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 6a. We'll be reading from the King James Version, as poetic as it is. Amen? Amen? Would you kindly, if you please, stand in reverence for the word of God? Amen. And the scripture reads as such. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. And as a root out of a dry ground, he hath no form of comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed of sin. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. Luke chapter 24, verses one through six. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher, and they entered in, and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed, thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid, and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living one among dead ones? He's not here, but he is been risen in Jesus' name and for his sake. You may be seated. Would you pray with us, if you please? Precious Lord, we come into your presence already knowing that you dwell within. But 
we are aware, dear Lord, of the price that was paid so we can come boldly to the throne. Lord, first and foremost, we ask that you hear our cry. We confess our sins. We will name them one by one when we get into the secret closet. Lord, we repent and ask for your forgiveness. Lord, please, we pray that what we are about to do here tonight be acceptable in your sight. We pray that you will strengthen these men as only you can, that they stand boldly, not in their own strength, but Lord, in the power and the encouragement of your Holy Spirit. And then, Lord, we pray that if there is one here who you draw with your spirit to yourself, that they let us know and we give you the joy. We give you, dear Lord, the glory. We give you the praise for what you and only you can do. Thank you for your darling son, Jesus the Christ, for who he is and for what he has done. And Lord, it's in his name and for his sake we pray. And your children said amen, amen. and amen. In sticking with the program, we will now have introduction of the preachers. And we ask that as they are introduced, that they please stand. First, with the word of forgiveness, we have Reverend Antonio Palmer. And he is a man. He is from Bethany Baptist Church in Lexington, Kentucky. Then we have the word of salvation by Reverend Eric Newcomer from Wrights One Baptist Church. A man. Then we have the word of affection. Of affliction, affliction I'm sorry by Reverend Dr. Chris White from First Baptist Church, Carrollton. Then we have the word of anguish. That is by Reverend Graham Reynolds, Gent Baptist Church, Gent, Kentucky. And you might recognize this next man. The word of suffering. I'm sorry, I got this mixed up. Or y'all in the wrong place? Y'all in the wrong place, okay. The, the word of suffering by Reverend Terrence Moore, Park Ridge Baptist Church. Then the word of victory by Reverend Cody Brown from somewhere. <laughs> from Faith Worship Center right here. And he is, thank you very much for your hospitality. Then we have the word of contentment by Reverend Devin G. You say it. Ola Che. Ola che from the United Methodist Church, Carrollton, Kentucky. Thank you, sir. Now, if we please, we'll have song and brother, our brother Dale Benhoff will come and lead us in the old rugged cross. After that, the preachers will come in the order they were announced. to welcome you to choir practice. <laughs> I needed a little lead into this song, but my pastor, he wouldn't, wouldn't go for it. So this is what I come up with.
so I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Oh, that old rugged cross so despised by the world has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. To the old rugged cross, I will ever be true. Its shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to my home far away where his glory forever I'll share. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Amen. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank God again for this blessed opportunity and privilege to be here once more and again. Thank the pastor of this great church here, Reverend Cody, Pastor Harris. Thank you for the invitation. It's glad to have my family here with me, my wife and my pastor and mother-in-law. It's always good to have support. Even got a cousin in the house. Amen. It's always good to see familiar faces, but whenever you're amongst God's people, it's always a familiar face. We also greet you in the name of our Father in heaven, whom having not seen, but yet love. We won't trouble you long. I know historically, I'm used to getting seven minutes. I was always told you stand up, speak up, shut up and sit down. So I will try to stay within that time frame to be obedient, but also follow the instruction of the Holy Spirit. For those of you that have your Bible, Luke chapter 23, beginning at verse 34, and I'll be reading from the New International Version. Again, that's Luke chapter number 23, beginning at verse number 34, when you have that say amen. And it reads like this, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. 
and they divided up his clothes by casting lots. If I could tag a title to this particular text, I would talk about the day that ignorance was prayed for. The day that ignorance was prayed for. As we, year after year, and technically ought to be Sunday after Sunday, that we ought to reflect and remember what Christ done for us. And as we look at this particular text, it's very interesting. After all that Jesus has been through, after all that he's endured, he prays. This is a statement. This is a prayer. And throughout the week, I begin to meditate and pray. After all that Jesus has been through in Gethsemane, if you recognize that he prayed there too, in his deepest agony, agony, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. It's very interesting. Jesus has, at this particular time, he's endured much. What's being done at this point has to be done for the fulfillment of the gospel. Because if this very moment in time had not have happened, all hope for humanity would have been lost. Now, I know we're such finite creatures, you know, we're human, and we can't understand the totality of the circumstances of what Jesus is really doing and what he's saying right here. But I got to thinking. He prays on the behalf of ignorant people. Sometimes we're surrounded by ignorant people. That's just the truth of the matter. And, 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 and this text taught me a lot throughout the week. You know, sometimes we have a tendency to get mad at people, denying the fact that they just may be an ignorant individual. And that's not being evil, but I, I'll say this. Anybody whose heart is not right with Christ, that's an ignorant person. Because in reality, they don't know what they're doing. They don't have any idea what they're doing, or they didn't have an idea who they were doing it to. But if we look at the uh, First Corinthians, it talks about if they hadn't known who he was, <laughs> Lord, have mercy, they wouldn't have done it. If they knew who he was, they would not have done it. But they did it anyway. And Jesus says, look, there are some things that I know that you don't know. And because I know that you don't know, I'm going to pray for you. And, 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 and this particular prayer is very interesting. It's not, a, it's not a selfish prayer. Actually, it's one of the most unselfish prayers in all of humanity. First, he recognizes Father. He gives reverence. When Jesus taught us how to pray, what did he say? Our Father, which art in heaven. So he says, in all his agony, in all his pain, and we got to understand that he was just literally nailed to the cross. But he cries out, Father, on the behalf of the ignorant folks that are crucifying him. Jesus had the capability of saying, hey, Lord, I want to forgive me. He didn't, he didn't do that. He said, Father, I want you to forgive them because they know not what they do. Lord, have mercy. As I said before, we're surrounded by people in some powerful places, making powerful decisions. They don't know what they're doing. They are clueless about what they're doing. But in this text, Christ is literally teaching us how to deal with adversity. The full meaning of forgiveness in its totality. When I think about forgiveness, this is where I come to in the Bible. Because this is what forgiveness truly is. This is what forgiveness truly looks like. This is the very definition, the very essence 
of forgiveness right here on Calvary's cross. Lord, have mercy. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they were doing. Now, I would imagine that if they would have known that he was the king of kings, or that he was the Lord of lords, or this blood that he was sharing, even shedding on not just the behalf of humanity, but even on their behalf. Lord, have mercy. Would they have second-guessed what they were really doing? But as I stated, this had to be done. This was necessary for the fulfillment of the gospel. And I don't want to get too excited, but I was glad when I heard that song about clinging to the old rugged cross. Because as Christians, that's all we have to cling to. As an old preacher once said, this is what won the game. Jesus had to endure the old rugged cross on our behalf for the sake of humanity so that we could have a right to the tree of life. But I'm so glad when I think about this text and I'm so glad when the pastor just read that he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, but by his stripes we are healed. And that's why I'm able to stand here today and proclaim the good news because he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. This is why we are alive today. This is why we are assembled today, because the work on Calvary's cross was necessary so that we could have a right to the tree of life. Oh, brothers and sisters, forgive me for getting so excited, but I can't help but talking about the name of Jesus, because I realize that one day every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I'm glad about that right now. Brothers and sisters, may I bid you farewell, but never forget what Jesus has done for you. Never forget that Jesus prayed on the behalf of ignorant individuals, and that prayer is still relevant and real today because we are surrounded by some ignorant people from the White House to the to Main Street, oh, your street or my street, we are surrounded by ignorant people, but God is still willing. He's still willing, and he's still able to forgive. May God bless you. May God keep you. May heaven forever smile upon you. Well, good evening. Y'all still in your seats? I almost wasn't, and if you knew who's saying that, that's a thing. We're still in Luke chapter 23, in this same context in which he prays forgiveness for those around him. Here's what he said to the thief a little later on. He said, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. This is the word of salvation, and let's have a little understanding of this, bring in the context of it. If we back up a little bit just before the verses he read, verse 32, it says, Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him, and when they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Go a little further down to verse 39. It says, One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Two thieves, one on each side, and an incredible contrast. One was saved, 
and went to be that very day with Jesus in paradise. That is heaven, kingdom of heaven. And the other thief, he received instant and eternal torment in hell and has the lake of fire to look forward to. Now, what was the difference between the two? When a word, it was faith. Might not be apparent from the text. One might say the difference was the words they said, and it's true, their words were very different, but words do not save. Only the Son of God saves. Because people can say or do anything, but salvation comes by the grace of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, not by any works of the law, lest any man should boast. And this text is here to prove this very point. Now, don't the works matter? Doesn't it matter what this man said? Well, yeah, works matter. The whole Bible's filled with that testimony. The works themselves are a testimony to his faith. And the words that he said are a very good sign because a true faith must have works. According to James chapter 2, according to Hebrews chapter 11, all the faithful of the Old Testament, they always demonstrated their faith. And this is why the New Testament commands repentance, which is a work. It commands confession, which is a work. And baptism, which is a work and a lifestyle of repentance and following Jesus. So the true believer will glorify God with his works and enjoy his salvation. What really mattered was the condition of his heart. Had the story ended with what he said, and we didn't have Jesus' reply, we could guess maybe this man was saved by Jesus, but we wouldn't know. But the fact that Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise, removes all doubt. It's the ultimate, because I said so. Jesus knew this man's heart. He always knew what people were thinking. The Gospel of John says that Jesus knew all people. And it says that he knew from the beginning those who those were who did not believe. So he also knew those who did. He says in the book of Revelation, he says himself, I am he who searches mind and heart. And this is a continuation of an Old Testament thought. Jeremiah 17, 10. I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind. This man was saved with no baptism, no catechism, no speaking in tongues, no works of righteousness, no church membership, no tithing. Not even a confession of Jesus as Lord nor a sinner's prayer. Nothing but a desperate request of a dying man for some consideration. He just said, remember me. So what does that mean to me? I mean, that's, that's a long time ago. That guy was in a rather different situation than myself, was he? Put yourself on the cross next to Jesus and you'll pick your side left or right for each and every human being has the same sentence as those men and as he said we indeed justly for we're receiving the due reward of our deeds our fate was sealed in the garden when God said to Adam and the day you eat of it you shall surely die and he went and he ate And the New Testament tells us, in Adam all die. And we testify to the truth of that reality when we ourselves sin. And if we have ever failed to put God first, if we've ever taken his name in vain or lied or lusted or envied or stolen, we have shown the testimony of our true nature and the justness of our condemnation. For all have sinned, fall short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. So we hang there like those thieves, receiving what we deserve, fighting for every breath, too far gone for human intervention. If by some miracle someone got us down off that cross, blood loss or infection is going to take us. 
the lifeblood is flowing away. And on that cross, we have no hope. And our own situation is equally as hopeless. But he made one desperate cry to the one who hung next to him. Do you get that? To the one hanging there next to him. When we cry out to Jesus, he is that one hanging there next to us. He's clearly not guilty, but he pronounces forgiveness on his enemies. They mock him, but he refuses to defend himself. Who is this? He has the confidence hanging there on the cross of one who put himself there for some very good reason. One desperate cry, and I encourage you to cry it aloud tonight if you have not as if it's with your dying breath. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So repent, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, grab hold. If this is hitting you and you, you're wondering, I don't think I've done that, I don't think I've cried out, grab hold of that one true Christian friend or family member. You know who they are. They're the ones who've been praying for you. They might have invited you to church a few times. They've been praying for you. Ask them, beg them to tell you the truth. Confess your sins. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. For he's the only way out of here alive. I was looking at the order of service tonight. I don't know what, gets, what goes into putting this order together, but you get the impression that the five Baptists are afraid of following the Methodist. I've been working on that since I got here, just for the record. John 19. 25 through 27, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene, John 19. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son, and to his disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, the disciple took her into his home. Well, according to Mark 1.31, it was the habit of Jesus to withdraw to lonely places to pray. Lonely meaning a refuge. And here in John 19, however, Jesus is facing a different definition of a lonely place. He's surrounded by a crowd, but there's no lonelier place than the cross. He'd been crucified a form of torture perfected by the Romans, borrowed from the Persians for the worst criminals, Nails in hands, nails in feet, a rope strung under his arms to keep him breathing longer and to extend the torture. And if the torture was ended, they ended it by breaking your legs. He was suffering. He was suffering because of nails, but also because he'd been betrayed. He'd been unjustly accused, unjustly convicted, traded for the freedom of Barabbas, a choice of nation over kingdom of God, mocked by the religious and jeered by the men also on crosses. It was a lonely place, that cross. But as helpless as he was, a refuge, a lonely place, was still available. If he wanted, Jesus could close his eyes. He could close his ears. He could push the noise, the betrayals, the nonsense of the world away. And if ever a man earned the right to withdraw to a lonely place, to a, I'm done listening to all of you fools quiet place, to a take care of your own problems angry place, to a see how you do without me wounded pride place, Jesus on the cross earned a lonely place. He earned a lonely place where he thought only of his suffering, not theirs. Where he thought of his pain, not theirs. Where he could just think about his life, not theirs. If ever a man earned the right to withdraw into his suffering, to make a home there, to close the door on the world, even on a friend he loved and a mother who loved him, 
Jesus earned the right. If ever a man earned a pass on paying attention to the crosses of other people, Jesus earned that right. If ever a man, even a savior of men, earned the right to say, right now, my suffering, not yours, it was Jesus. Are you ready? But that's not how our Jesus suffers. Our Jesus suffers injustice. Our Jesus suffers betrayal. Our Jesus suffers disappointment. Our Jesus suffers pain. Our Jesus suffers even death. And he looks out. Our Jesus looks out from his suffering and sees the suffering of his mother. Our Jesus looks out from his suffering and sees the suffering of a friend. Our Jesus looks out from his suffering, sees the suffering of a man on a cross beside him. Might be a good sermon, Eric. Our Jesus. Our Jesus sees from his cross that all of his friends are bearing crosses of their own. Our Jesus can listen from a cross. Our Jesus can speak from a cross. Our Jesus can forgive from a cross. Our Jesus can promise paradise from a cross. Our Jesus can deny himself the oh-so-sweet lonely places of self-pity to feel pity for his mother, to feel pity for a disciple, to feel pity for a criminal, to feel pity for a world, to feel pity for you, to feel pity for me. Our Jesus can see the coming end, the coming end of his own life, and still make room for all the people who are going to survive him. That's our Jesus. Our Jesus does all that from the cross, all that from his own suffering. And I wonder if that can be said of you, or if that can be said of me. Dad? Yeah, Dad suffered. But Dad made a home of suffering and locked the door on the rest of us. He never looked out from his suffering and saw that we were suffering too. That was how Dad dealt with his suffering. Mom? Mom had her crosses hard ones. But you know what? She made a home on that cross and never found a way to look out at us and that we were carrying crosses too. My best friend, she never learned to listen from her cross. She never learned to speak to me from her cross. She never learned to forgive me from her cross. She never reminded me from her cross that Jesus is faithful to people on crosses. But what if your people said this, Dad, Dad suffered, but Dad didn't make a home of his suffering. He saw we were suffering too. We were never alone. We were never alone in our suffering because Dad saw us from his suffering. Mom, Mom had crosses, crosses to bear I couldn't understand. But you know what? She looked out from her cross and looked at me on mine, on mine. My best friend, my best friend, my best friend listened from her cross. She spoke to me from her cross. She forgave me from her cross. She reminded me from her cross that Jesus is faithful to people like us, people who are on crosses, people who are bearing crosses. She's my best friend. I remind you, near your cross stands a mother who's also bearing one. And near your cross stands a friend who's also bearing one. Look at them. Listen to them. Talk to them. I'll be reading from Matthew 27, 46. You know, as I've read 
the, the, the Gospels, I've come to know, and I'm sure you do as well, Jesus and his father were like that. Like that. I'm just going to reel off a, a few uh, sayings that Jesus said, truths he said. He said this in John 10, 30. He said, I and the Father are one. I and the Father, we're one. There's no, there's no separation. Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27, he said this, No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son. And that word know, it's not just you, you kind of know about stuff. It means to fully know, to fully recognize. Jesus did. In John 14, one of the disciples said, Jesus, show us the Father. You know what he said? He says, anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. Okay? There's no difference, guys. There's no difference. You don't look at the Heavenly Father, you, you just look at me. We're one and the same. And I want you to think about this. While all this was going on, when he said this, he was on earth. Okay? He was in this world. You know, when he was in heaven, he had no issues communicating with the Father. Because in heaven, guess what? There's no frustration in heaven, is there? There's no hunger. There's no thirst. There's no other people's attitudes. Mm-hmm, hallelujah to that. Yeah. There's no what I like to call, some people in my church know what I'm talking about, there's no pot stirs in heaven. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. Jesus' own disciples were pot stirs, don't you know? They were arguing, well, who's going well, I'm better than you, well, I'm better than you, blah, blah, you know. She's like, come on, guys, don't you get it? Man. Mm. I'll say, I'll, I'll, I will say to you all here what, 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 what I say the, the, to, to, to my church. If somebody sticks a pot in front of you, don't put your spoon in it. Walk away. You hear what I'm saying? Life's got enough drama of its own, then try to get drum up other stuff, okay? That's all. I'll stop with that, and let's get on with it. All right, so. But Jesus had a perfect, seamless relationship with his Father. Okay? I mean, you, you got to know that. Perfect, seamless relationship. But all that changed when he went to the cross. All that changed. And he says in Matthew 27, 46. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sambachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, in case you didn't know, Jesus actually quotes Psalm 22.1. That's the actual quote. And I encourage you sometimes, just read Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53, and you'll see those words were written many, many years before, but man, that's, it's just it's what it talks about Jesus when he was on the cross, all right? But when Jesus was hanging on that cross, you see, he became a sacrifice for all sins of the world, all my sins, all your sins. Jesus willingly bore them that day, people. Willingly bore them. If you remember, when he was in the garden, he asked three times. Three times he asked. Not just once, but three times. Hey, God, I don't like plan A. Can we have plan B, please? We've all been there. He knew what needed to be done, but when it came right down to it, he didn't want to do it. But he said, Lord, not what I want, Lord. Not your will be done. Not my will be done, but your will be done. All right? And that cup was the cup of God's wrath for the sins of the world. And he drank of it that day. The full measure 
of it. He drank of it. And when he took the sins of the world, the relationship from his father was severed. Remember, they were like that. But when that, when that cross happened, it was severed, gone. Because the Heavenly Father cannot look on sin. And his father turned his back on his son that day. Think about that. That's hard for me to imagine. But the Heavenly Father turned his back on his son that day for you. He did that. He did that. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The sinless one became sin for you and me. He became sin for you and me so that we could become righteous in his sight. Because we're not righteous in our own, in our own deeds, are we? Isaiah 64, 6 says, all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. All right? Check it out. Read it. You'll see it. It's in there. All our righteous acts don't mean nothing in front of a perfect, sinless, holy God. Think about this. Jesus experienced darkness so that you could bask in the light. He died so that you could live. He went down to the depths of hell so that you could go up to heaven. All right? He experienced abandonment from his father so that you could have a relationship like that with his father. Think about that. Jesus was forsaken so that you would never, ever have to be. And it says, I'm going to end here in James 4, 8. Draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. Not in our own works, not in our own righteousness, but because of that cross, church. Because of the cross. You draw near to him. He's not going to go, ooh, ooh, get away, get away, get away. No. He's going to say, come on. Let's sit down and let's talk about this. Let's talk. Jesus was forsaken so that you would never have to be. get used to holding this mic I'm used to having my hands free where I can do all the stuff I do with my hands all righty uh, those who brought your Bibles turn to uh, John the 19th chapter John the 19th chapter uh, it has on the program verse 28 but you have to almost include verse 29 I'm sure Pastor Harris can appreciate that um, and it reads as thus, John 19, verses 28 and 29, says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, or hyssop, however you want to say it, and put it to his mouth. Amen. I want you all to be thinking about this topic as I bring this message. Uh, what is in your cup? What is in your cup? Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Father God, for this opportunity to stand before your people, Lord, to preach and do that which you've called me to do, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for equipping me, sending me, and helping me, Lord, to do that which you've called me to do. Now, I pray, Lord, you let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. 
Amen. Uh, I can't help but look at these words in here, and, and, and I know I can't, I can't get all the meat off this bone, but there's some select portions on this bone that the fellas we got to deal with. Uh, now, yeah, the scripture says after this, and I like this because, because with most scriptures, and even with this scripture, you can go back and look and see what this is after. But, but, but the writer gives you what you need right here. It says, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished. So, so yeah. <laughs> I understand that when it says words like accomplished, I understand that there obviously had to be a plan. And obviously that plan had to be fulfilled. Yeah. And the scripture also tells us that during Jesus' ministry, when he's dealing with his disciples, uh, it says that uh, um, in Luke 18 and verse 31, it says, Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, now this is before they went to Jerusalem. He said, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. He said, Hey, everything that they wrote about me <laughs> that's going to happen to me on the face of this earth is going to happen. Yeah. And the scripture says, After this, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished. Yeah. I love this because this is talking about how accurate the word of God is. This is talking about and reaffirming the fact that God is not a man that he should lie. Yeah. This is confirming the fact that if God wrote it, you can count on it. Yeah. Yeah. Isaiah said it like this. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of God shall stand forever. And Jesus even said to his disciples on several occasions, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Now, when we get back to this, uh, what Jesus told his disciples about these things being accomplished, Jesus was talking about the suffering that he would endure at the hands of evil men who had been convinced by Satan that Jesus was the worst sinner of all. Amen. And it also refers back to that uh, 69th division of Psalm where David is talking about uh, how he needed help, how he needed uh, support, how he needed love and compassion. He needed, he needed something from people that he knew could, that he knew they could deliver it to him, but they didn't, they wouldn't give it to him. Y'all stay with me. Uh, Psalm 69 and 20 says, it says, reproach hath broken my heart. This is the words of David. And I am full of heaviness. And I looked for some to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. David is simply saying, they kicked me when I was down. Come on now. Yeah. The body of Christ, the church, the children of God, we are at our best when we are compassionate, forgiving, merciful, kind and loving towards one another as well as our fellow man. Come on now. We are at our best when we give the Lord what he asks of us in service, trust, faith, devotion, humility, and love. As Jesus demonstrated his love uh, throughout his ministry in the presence of his enemies, as well as in the presence of his disciples, he was showing them how to love, even in spite of the frustrations, even in spite of the pot stirrers, even in spite of everything, Jesus was showing them how to do that. And Jesus also warned, he said, look, inasmuch as you've done anything to the least of these, my brethren, my children, Lord have mercy, you've done it unto me. And they said, Lord, when do we see you Hungry? When do we see you naked? When do we see you in need? And that's when Jesus said, when you've done it to the least of these. Yeah. When you've done it not to the least of these, you've done it to me or you've done it not to me. See, because what you have whew, in our world today, just like it was back then, sometimes we are more willing to help others than we are some others. Yeah. In other words, we withhold that love, that compassion, that help from some who we don't feel like or who we've already 
I don't know, figured that we don't want to help for whatever reason. So I asked this question when concerning what is in your cup. What would you give the Lord if he looked upon you and said, I thirst? What would you give the Lord Jesus, our Lord, our God, our Master, our King? What would you give the Lord if he looked at you and said, I thirst? The question for this evening is really quite simple. What is in your cup? When I consider gospel ministry, the gospel message, and the New Testament church mission, I can't help but think of how thirsty Jesus is for the faithful laborers and faithful workers in his harvest. The Lord's workers must have faith enough to be obedient enough <laughs> to fill our cups with love, grace, and mercy. That love, grace, and mercy that comes from Jesus, we should have the faith and obedience enough to pour from that same cup that he fills into and onto and unto anyone else that needs that faith, that mercy, and that grace. I wish I had somebody to hear me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is in our cup is a probing question because it challenges us to examine ourselves and our relationship with Jesus the Christ. What is in your cup is a troubling question because it challenges us to be honest with ourselves about our need to be more compassionate, more forgiving, and more repentant. How about that for a cylinder word? Yeah, yeah. What is in your cup is a penetrating question because it challenges us to be a little more like Jesus and a little less like me. Now, I like, I like my mellow yellow. I don't know where y'all laughing. Y'all got stuff y'all like too. But I like my mellow yellow. I don't particularly like to share my mellow yellow. <laughs> but I ought to be filled with the love of Jesus enough <sighs> to pour out all of my mellow yellow that's in my cup into the cup of anyone who comes to me and has a thirst and a need for Mellow Yellow. Why? Simply because everybody, and I mean everybody, ought to know who Jesus is. You hear me? And when they come to me, a child of God, a professed child of God, an unashamed child of God, I should be willing to give of myself and give what I have that the Lord gave me to make sure that someone sees and feels and hears and even smells the love of Jesus just because they're around somebody who's got Jesus on the inside. All I'm saying is everybody ought to know who Jesus is. Everybody ought to know what Jesus has done and everybody ought to know what Jesus has promised. So when I ask the question, what is in your cup? All I'm saying is we need to make sure that what we have in our cup is what the Lord wants us to give out because the message and the mission is gospel ministry because God said, I want my house to be filled. Yeah, God said, I want my house to be filled. And it is God that said, I don't want any seats empty in my house. So he sends preachers and pastors and teachers and prophets that we may proclaim the word of God and that we may proclaim God's message that it's not his will that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. What is in your cup? Yeah. Y'all awake now? Yeah. All right. Well, it is uh, an honor to be back and to, to help host to uh, pour out our mellow yellow for the brothers and sisters of Christ to be able to be here tonight and to, to celebrate and worship our Savior. Amen. Um, as a church, we've been in, uh, 
what we call, a, you know, a series leading up to, to Easter all about grace. Um, I highly recommend talking about grace leading up to Easter because I have been, for lack of a better term, marinating in this for the past six weeks or so. And uh, as I sat down and uh, began to just read the verse that I get the opportunity to bring to you tonight, um, something just kind of came out of my spirit. It was, it was I, I have no other way of describing it except that it was like word vomit, all right? Just on the page, just from adoration of just marinating in the subject of God's grace in our life. And uh, I thought that maybe I would take that and, and build a message around it, but um, I just couldn't get off of what just came out in that moment in my office. And so um, it's going to be a little bit different. This is less of a message and more of an exhortation tonight. And uh, I felt like I was supposed to read this just as it is. And so the word that I get the privilege of bringing today is John chapter 19, verse 30. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Can you imagine what it would have been like to be there? The whirlwind of the few days since the Passover meal from celebration and remembrance and Jesus washing your feet, a moment of uncomfortable humility. Completely unaware that as you sat down and ate the Passover lamb at the table that you were also eating with the sacrificial lamb. And it would come to be known as the Last Supper, but for you it was just dinner. It was just a celebration. It was remembrance with your friend, your teacher, your savior. And from there, moments begin to come quick and spin more and more out of control. From your point of view, Jesus, the Messiah, God, was invincible. He was indestructible. And just a few la days later from praying in the garden, here you are now, Jesus above you on the cross. And then to hear forgiveness come from Jesus' mouth. To see the care for his mother and his disciples, to hear the agony of his breathing beginning to get more and more labored, to hear him cry out to God his Father because the feeling of abandonment set in as he took the punishment for all of our sin. Can you place yourself there? As Jesus, the Savior, the one who could not be conquered, not by sin, not by temptation, not by doubt, not by the strongest demons, and not even by death, gave himself up freely. The one who did not count his equality with God something to be kept, but laid it down to humble himself even to this very moment. Death on a cross. Surrendered. The one who could not be beaten, could not be silenced or killed, let himself be beaten, remained silent, and submitted himself to death. And after enduring every human temptation and every trial and weakness, he still remained unblemished and perfect and still walked right in to the torture and the pain that was God's plan. And now his fully human body broken down beyond the ability to continue living. And imagine seeing your Savior there, your teacher, your friend, your son. Can you put yourself in that moment and, and sense the chaos in the air, hope fading, knowing that Jesus was the Savior? Maybe for a moment you thought this would be the time that he would free himself, show how powerful he was. Surely as they mocked him and beat him, this would be the moment for his strength to show. And instead, he humbly asks for a drink. And after that bitter taste, feeling the weight of sin and the feeling of life leaving his body, he said, it is finished. Can you imagine hearing those words? But you have heard them, haven't you? You have heard them. The words of the word who was in the beginning, the word who was made flesh, who was with God, and who was God, and whose words from that cross that day created power and action, just as they did in the beginning in Genesis when all things were created. But in this moment, a veil was ripped. 
The separation from God's presence, from an undeserved and unsanctified people was done away with in that moment. And the power of these words was not seen or felt in its full intensity in the natural. Oh, but in the spirit realm, in the eternal realm, they were felt. And those words blasted through eternity and in every day and in every hour and in every moment since that day that they were spoken from the cross, they continue to hold the same power. The same power. They continue to break the same chains, to proclaim the same hope. Did you hear them? I know I did. As those words of finality echoed through eternity, they found me. They found me. Those words of hope. Those words of life found me right where I was in sin with a veil over my eyes, shielding me from what was seen as the finished work. Instead, caught up in a false reality, still slave, not because the work was unfinished, but shielding me from that truth because I was unaware of how finished that work really was. I was lost, knowing only the game of works, a game in which I did not have a winning record. Not knowing that there was a celebration of grace and victory, one ball field only over from mine, and I had no clue that it was there. But I heard him say, it's finished. Did you? As a veil was torn from my eyes, as I heard the message of love in those words, the message of hope in those words, the message of forgiveness in those words, I too that day decided that I was finished. I was finished with me. I heard the words, did you? And since hearing them once, I can't go a day without hearing them. On the days when I struggle, on the days that I feel defeated, I hear them again. In the moments where I mess up and miss God and I come to him in repentance and he's faithful to forgive, I hear those words again. Every morning as grace and mercy meets me for the day, I hear those words again. Every time I see a fruit of his character bore in my life that I know isn't of me, but it's a work of God in me, I hear those words again. Every moment that I take a step of faith as anxiousness and fear tries to pull me out of the promise of God's word, I hear those same words again. Every blessing that I see in my life, I hear those words again. When the enemy and the accuser speak lies to my ear and attempts to place a veil back over me, I hear those words again. It is finished. And through those words... I have access and communion to God. And so what was finished? The promised work. The sacrifice that had been foretold from the moment that sin entered the earth. The solution that started in the garden and was now in its final moment of war with sin and darkness. What was finished? The defeat of sin. The redemption of God's people. The promise of salvation the healing of disease, the payment for our peace, new life, adoption unto God, a new master. We were made alive, made whole, seated in heavenly places, given the authority of God, given God's spirit and his nature, his gifts. We have pure victory through those words. And that's not even a comprehensive list. I heard the words, did you? Luke chapter 4, verse 16. So he came to Nazareth, and when he had been brought up, and he entered the synagogue, as was a custom on the Sabbath day, he stood up and he read. And it was handed to him the book of the prophet Isaiah. He opened it in the book, and he found the place on purpose where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Why? Because he has anointed me to preach the good news of the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to announce release of the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. He sent forth as to deliver those who are oppressed and downtrodden and bruised and crushed to proclaim and accept the acceptable year of the Lord, the day of salvation and the free favor of God will abound. Then he rolled the book back up and he gave it back to the attendant and he sat down. And the eyes of all the synagogue were gazing at him, and he began to speak to them. And he said this, Today the scripture has been fulfilled while you are present and hearing. This was the work 
This was the assignment, the rescue mission. This was the it that he talked about. Prophesied in Isaiah, publicly declared in Luke chapter 4 that we just read, and fulfilled in John chapter 19. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. It is finished. Paid in full. I heard the words, did you? And if like me, you've heard those words, and you know how finished it truly is, let us not live a day of our life like it's not finished. I don't have much time. But you know what? Neither did Jesus. Because this is the last saying from the cross. And it's found from the Gospel of Luke, beginning in chapter 23 in 46. But I'm going to start out from verse 44. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. Now, you've already heard the other six expressions from the cross. There's one left. Keep in mind that whenever this chapter or this section of um, passage opens up, this is something new. This is something strange. There is a historian that said that there was a full eclipse of the sun. This was during the Passover. The Passover is always held on a full moon. There is no way the sun could have come across the shadow and caused the darkness. But what did cause the darkness was the light of the world going out. And what happened in this time, you've heard the six expressions, and throughout it all, you have heard Jesus' ministry of love, of forgiveness, promise of paradise to come, concern for others. Everything that he has done has been a model for the disciples to follow after him. But there's one expression that's left. And he, be, he ends his ministry where he started, affirming everything that he had done for the Father, through the Father, and by his strength, and by his will, according to his great plan and design. And so Jesus says, when he had cried out with a loud voice, he is dying. He is unable to take a breath. He has to stretch up against the nails. And after being in his bloody battered, beaten, almost dead condition, he is still able to cry out with a loud voice. Why? Because he wanted everybody around to hear him. And what did he say? He said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. You know the word commend is interesting in the Greek because what it means is I am placing something of great value into the hands of someone else for safekeeping. It's not something that's lost. It's not something that is going to be put aside. It's not going to be something that's going to be misappropriated. It is going to be something that is going to be cherished, taken care of, honored. And so when Jesus says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit, he provides the final example of how you and I should be when it's our turn to go or whenever we are facing great periods of stress, and that is to be able to say, Lord, all that I am, I commend to you. All that I will ever be is in your hands because I know that I have fulfilled the task that you've called me to do, and I know that I can entrust everything to you for eternity because of the relationship that I have with you. Remember, when Jesus is on the cross, this is the perfect model for the disciples to follow. Everything that Jesus was about is encapsulated on this time. The miracles are great. The healings are wonderful. The teachings are fantastic. But it's in these moments when he was so tempted to go 
into a world of his own hurt, that he looked out because he knew that there were going to be people, you and I, 20 centuries down the road, that were going to need to hear that, that we're going to need to hear that there is hope of a hereafter, that what we do has meaning and what we do has purpose. And that it's not you and I doing all of this on our own. We can tap into the same relationship that Jesus has with the Father to be able to have our cups filled when we need it. Because it is only through Jesus' relationship with the Father that he could endure all of these things. It is only through his relationship that he is able to be the model for you and I and to say ultimately, Lord, into your hands alone. Do I commend who I am? And when he does this, he breathed his last. You know, it's interesting because out of the four gospel accounts, and keep in mind that all the gospels have a slightly different perspective on the events, not a single one of them said that he died. The Pauline epistles say it later. But all of the gospel writers want us to understand that everything Jesus did, from coming into the world to coming out of it, He did of his own volition, of his own choice. He chose that. He didn't want it. He asked for plan B. But he went ahead and he accepted it because he knew it would ultimately fulfill the Father's desire that all would be saved and fill his house. This is the reason why the blood is all important. Because the scripture says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And that blood, when it flowed down Calvary's cross, that was good enough for all of humanity afterwards. Those who would come to the cross and say, Lord Jesus, I accept. Lord Jesus, I believe. Because that blood covers entirely. That is the only thing that saves. And this is something else that's important that we need to proclaim as Christ's people that have been saved by the blood is that when someone dies and they turn their back on what it cost God to give through Jesus Christ, that person sends themselves to hell. Jesus made the way open. So that way, Jesus was able to say, No man cometh unto the Father except through me. Why? Because I am the resurrection and the life. No man cometh unto the Father except through me. Because his blood paid it entirely. So what are we supposed to do with this? Well, thank God for Easter because it's coming up. Resurrection Day. And that's when we look the best. And believe me, Second Baptist Church folks know how to look the best. (laughs) Easter Sunday. I see it. I see it. But we are to proclaim, not us, not our particular outpost called our individual church. We are to proclaim the one thing that unites us all. Because there is a world out there that is ignorant. There is a world out there that is blind. And there is a world out there that needs to hear, yes, there is a Savior out here that can save you no matter what you've done, where you've been, what you've seen, what you've experienced, or where you're going to go. But you can be used in a way that is going to be more fantastic than you could ever hope to achieve on your own. Why? Because of the blood that saves, the blood that revitalizes, and the blood that gives hope. And when our time comes and we use every available moment that we were given, when we use it for his honor and his glory, we're able to be a blessing unto others. We can forgive others. We can encourage others and we can point the way to paradise because that is the only way there. And so when Resurrection Sunday comes, there's 364 days after that in which we still proclaim the truth of Easter. So my prayer is that for all of us as we meditate on these seven sayings and we rejoice on Easter Sunday that we come out revitalized, refreshed, and renewed because it doesn't matter what the world says out there. What matters is the truth of what God did on Calvary.
something? All of us who have been born again can say without a shadow of a doubt what Paul said in the book of Galatians, chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I pray that you never forget that as you listen to these men, these preachers, that you never forget that God is holy. He is just. Now look at Calvary. Would you kindly stand? We'll now have Miss Anna Anderson. I want to call her sister. I'm sorry. But Miss Anna Anderson, and turn to the back of your program, and you're going to find the reason we're here. God sent his son. They call him Jesus. He came to love.
bow your head, please. Precious Lord, our hearts are on fire. Our minds are focused on you. And Lord, this is only a taste, a foretaste of what's to come. Precious Lord, we remember who you are and what you've done to declare your own glory. And as we go down from here, we ask for your traveling mercy so that when we pull into the driveway, into the alley, into the garage, we'll pause for long enough to say, thank you, Jesus. You're not through with us yet. It's in Jesus' name and for his sake, all of his children said amen.